Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Anybody on Facebook or other social media notice people are starting to post countdowns to the holidays? Has anybody seen one of those? I've seen a few. I have some friends who are kind of Christmas crazy, so they're like, July is when the Christmas music starts. And and those same people are the ones posting like 192 days till Christmas, which which is funny in the summer, but now those numbers are getting smaller. If you we're not in the three digits anymore, what's going on? Christmas is coming quickly. And for a big chunk of my life, I used to be the same way. For birthdays and Christmas, I would like count down the days. I was so excited. But now I've kind of changed in that thinking, like even if it's something I'm really looking forward to, I'm not wishing away days of my life because I realize they're limited. So I don't want to just fast forward through the next 180 so I can get to one certain day. I want to make sure I'm living each one of those 180 to the best of my ability because I don't know how many more God's going to give me. But I still really, really look forward to Christmas. I'm excited about that time of year. Uh, We have a tradition in our family that we let the kids open one gift on Christmas Eve. And the way that unfolds in our family is a good illustration for something we're going to be talking about this morning. So Sabrina and I agreed, determined a long, long time ago, like in the 20-year-ago range, that that first gift that they would open on Christmas Eve for every kid would be some PJs so that when we got up on Sunday or whatever Christmas Day morning is for Christmas presents, we would have good pictures because everybody would have their brand new jammies and be looking all happy and well-rested. At least that was the theory. (laughs) So every kid, every Christmas Eve, gets a new pair of Christmas pajamas, right? That's the deal. And at first, the kids are little enough that they don't care what's in that first present. They're so excited to open a present on Christmas Eve, they're delirious with joy. Then they go into a middle phase, where it's Christmas Eve and I'm excited, but I know these are going to be pajamas. They're old enough to know what it is, and they're also old enough to not be super excited by the pajamas because they want the latest Lego set or Barbie doll or whatever it is that they're excited about. And then it comes back in the late teen years, they actually get excited about the pajamas again because they realize the value of the pajamas. And that same thing happened to me as a kid. I remember that I had certain aunts that I was not very excited about opening whatever they were going to give me for Christmas. Even on Christmas Day... Because one of them was going to crochet me a sweater, reliably, and I wasn't super excited for their crocheted sweater, to be honest. Right? And then uh, my grandparents on one side, every holiday, Christmas, birthday, whatever, it was going to be a book. Right? And in both cases, the book or the sweater is not quite as exciting to that you know, 6 to 12 year age kid as a toy or cash. I was big into cash as a kid. Right? And... So it, I wasn't super excited about those, but then again, I hit the late teenage years, and I realized some, those are better than a lot of the toys, because the toys within a couple months are going to the dump, depending on the toy. Some lasted longer than a couple months. But the sweater, I mean, you get to my, I'm 43. Just this past week, I celebrated my 43rd birthday. I still have some of my clothes from high school. Like, I, I do not get rid of clothes easily unless Sabrina makes them disappear. That, that happens periodically. <laughs> And so I realized that actually those gifts that I kind of looked down upon sometimes as a kid were the better gifts. And those books from Grandma and Grandpa became precious, right? That's how I got the Chronicles of Narnia, because a book at a time, Grandma was faithfully sending me the Chronicles of Narnia. And then when I got a little older and she saw that I was really passionate about sports, she would find godly athletes who had written biographies about their relationship with God and how they worked that out in their sports world life. And that's the kind of book she got me because she wanted to invest in her grandson's relationship with God. And yeah, there was a time when I was little when a book seemed like a boring gift to unwrap. But as I grew older and looking back now, I realized some of the gifts that I looked down upon were the absolute best gifts that I was given. And this morning we're going to see some people who were given a precious gift, but they didn't receive it as a precious gift. And as a result, there were tragic consequences. So if you have your Bible with you, turn in it to Acts chapter 7. We're actually going to finish Acts chapter 7 today. We're going to pick it up in verse 54. So Acts 7, 54 is where we're headed in our Bibles. And as you're turning there, I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity we have to look into your word together. Lord, as we relive again, this dark period in 
the history of these people who are called your people, this dark chapter in your book uh, where a heavy price was paid. Help us to see the bright hope that shines through even this dark chapter. Help us to see you at work in the midst of the tragedy. And help us to trust and believe that you're at work in the midst of our tragedies too. That you're turning the dark, scary moments of life into something beautiful. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to honor you with the time that you give us here on earth. Help us to use this time that you've given us together around your word for your glory in the way that we respond to this teaching this morning as we go into our workplaces and our schools tomorrow. Help us to lift you up. Help people to see who you are better because of the way we're living our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is our fourth Sunday in Acts chapter 7. And we've actually spread that out a little because we had a couple guest speakers in there. So we've been a month now in Acts chapter 7. And for the whole month, there's been this kind of repeated theme of Stephen, who is on trial for blasphemy, basically, launching into a sermon that's a history review of the Pentateuch for a bunch of people who were basically history teachers of the Pentateuch. And he's just gone on and on. He begins with, remember, showing them a little bit of honor and respect. We see the words are and we. And then last week we saw a sudden shift in that. Instead of identifying himself as the same family as these guys, he starts using your and you, making this big line so everybody can clearly see a point of delineation between a family by ethnicity and a family by faith in God, and which one was more important. The R's and the we's at the beginning identified their common heritage, but the you and the yours recognized that there was a key difference. What they were really believing was different from what Stephen believed. And he's also taken them through 1,500 years of biblical history, right? Maybe even a little more. We go all the way from Joseph, and then into Moses, and then up to Jesus, to the very moment he's standing there, teaching them, talking about their persecution of the just one. That was Jesus. And now we're finally going to see their response. And some of you probably have some pretty good guesses, if you haven't read it already, as to what the response is going to be. He's lecturing the history teachers about history in the context of them getting ready to kill him for blasphemy. What do you think they're going to do? Look at verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. His words penetrated. The truth that he was speaking registered with them, but not quite in the way that we might hope it might register. They're offended. They're deeply irritated that he's telling them they missed the boat. He's telling them God gave them warning after warning, and instead of heeding the warnings, they killed the ones bringing the warning. Instead of repenting and turning, they killed the uncomfortable messengers. People who brought a message they didn't want to hear had to be silenced. And that's why this morning's message is entitled, Unacceptable Truth Silenced. And we've all experienced this in our lives. You've been around someone saying something you didn't want to hear, and you took whatever means necessary to silence that person, right? Often it's just as easy as turning the channel on the TV, or changing the station on the radio, or closing a book, but not always, right? As a kid, there were probably times your parents told you truth that you didn't want to hear. And so what did you do? Some of you ran to your room and slammed the door. I know because I tried it myself. And so we hear these things that are true, but we don't want to deal with that truth. Because if I really admit that's true, there's something wrong with me. And none of us is comfortable admitting there's something wrong with me. So rather than admitting there's something wrong with me, I'm going to shut the door, change the station, turn off the radio, whatever I have to do to make that noise that's convicting me go away. And we see that's what they did. They gnashed at him with their teeth. The Greek word that's translated gnashing of the teeth comes from a wild animal devouring its prey. The, the hungry smacking of the jaws as they devoured their prey. And that's what these guys are doing towards Stephen. They're so angry at him. They want to communicate their displeasure with this uncomfortable truth. And they're about to communicate that in a very clear way. And I want us to just see 
one observation from the way they respond. That is, profound truth is not always received with pleasure. Profound truth is not always received with pleasure. And on the surface, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If someone's going to go to the trouble to reveal this deep, profound truth to me, shouldn't I be thankful? Shouldn't I be pleased that someone would invest their energy in communicating truth to me? Yeah, I should. But often we don't. Because the truth reveals truth about us, too. And in seeing who I really am, sometimes that's not a beautiful picture. And so I'm not going to receive with pleasure that correction from God. And that means whoever that intermediary is, the person who brings God's message to me, may be a source of offense. And I might even get violent with that person if they offend me enough. If the truth they deliver is profound enough, I may receive that in a hostile manner. And in the context that we're dealing with now, it really, really doesn't make sense. These folks had been equipped by God for generations with the tools that they needed to process the truth, hadn't they? What tools did the Israelites have, the Jews of this time have, unique to the rest of the world in terms of processing the truth that God had revealed about himself? They had the closest thing to a Bible going, right? They had the revealed word of God in the prophets and in the Pentateuch. They had the Old Testament of your Bible, and they could read it. Most of the world didn't have that, but these guys did. They had the Holy Spirit of God at work in their worship. They had a meeting place set apart for them to spend time with God. This whole system was designed that God's truth could be revealed to humanity. And the very people who had been entrusted with all these precious gifts have a spokesman for the truth in their midst, and they respond violently with gnashing their teeth at him. So certainly profound truth is not always received with pleasure. And I want us to really, really sink into the idea that we are not different from them. Okay? As stupid as we think they were, we do the same thing. So I brought some things to help us with that. We'll start with this one. This probably looks familiar to a few of us. Does anybody know what I've got in my hand? It's a glove, a mitt. Some people call it a mitt, right? What is the purpose of this thing? To catch balls, right? If I do my part, right, this thing will assist me in catching a baseball. And this particular one has been used for a whole generation of me being a dad, right? Every single one of my kids has played catch with me with this glove, has seen me use this to be their coach for t-ball or little league or whatever level of baseball they were playing. So this glove has been useful to me, and really it's just a tool, right? Why is it? Design because if I play baseball with this hand like this, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to stop really quick because after the first or second catch, my hand's going to be useless. I know because I've tried. We develop tools for a reason, and this is a powerful tool for helping me catch baseballs. What is this? Bike pump. It's a bike pump, right? And I have a road bike, and road bike tires operate at a much higher pressure than most normal bike tires, even the tires in your car. They're like over 100 PSI that you inflate your bike tire to. So if I were to try to grab the stem of my tire and inflate it with my mouth, what's going to happen? Absolutely nothing. The tire's going to laugh at me as it goes and blows all the air back in my face. That's how it works. So I need a tool like this that can compress air better than my lungs can. And this was designed for that purpose, so when my tire gets flat, I can inflate my tire and still ride my bike. That one has also been pretty well used, as you can tell by the way it looks. This one is new. Look, the tag is still on it, because I've only used it once, and I wish I didn't use it that one time. So we've recently had some plumbing challenges in the kitchen, and um, I had spent the evenings after work when I had free time, which is not a lot, working on reestablishing plumbing in our kitchen. So I completely got out of the kitchen. There's no cabinets, nothing, just holes in the wall, right? And then we got the new dishwasher, the new fridge, the new sink. So that means we need supply line to the dishwasher, supply line to the sink, supply line to the fridge, and some kind of draining system for all that, right? So it goes back out somewhere where I don't have to deal with the wastewater, right? That's the, the goal. And so I'd spend a couple hours in the evening and there were leaks. I'm sure many of you have experienced this, right? I put it all together the way you're supposed to put it all together, and something's leaking. So I do it again, 
but then I have to go to bed and get up and go to work and all that stuff. So as I'm at work, I'm thinking about the leak under the sink until finally it's like Thursday night or Friday night, and I'm like, tonight, whatever it takes, this whole kitchen plumbing is going to be done. And ladies, I'm sure some of you have had a husband at some point who just decides this mission is going to be accomplished, and I don't care what I have to do or how much money I have to spend or what I have to break. (laughs) Tonight, our plumbing is going to work. And that happened. So right when I got off work, I went to Lowe's, and I got two of these because I knew the, the common place that was always leaking was where the last drain pipe went into the wall. And none of my wrenches are big enough to deal with that last washer. And so, you know, I had fixed everything else, and I'm fixing this tonight. So we got two of these, and I'm going to take apart the wall until there are no more leaks. So I was up until 2 in the morning with this guy and his friend, crammed in the cabinet, you know, doing this to replace what ended up being a leaky gasket on the main drain thing, which is super tight and had been there longer than I've been alive, right? So it's like breaking the rust apart. And finally it fixed. And now you can use our kitchen. It's a very happy day. <laughs> but why? I could not possibly have restored our plumbing without this guy and his friend. I'm not strong enough with my hands to just twist that thing. There's no way I could have done it. So I used two of those. All three of these are useful tools but all three of them have a limited application. What if on that Friday night I put this glove on as I began to work on the plumbing under the sink? (laughs) How effective would I have been? No, I would have been disappointed. Or if I try to open this to the exact diameter of a baseball and run around the baseball field like this, (laughs) how many pop flies am I going to catch? Not many. Even if God gives us all the exact right tools, we still have to use them and use them correctly, or we're not going to get the job done. My bike pump does not help me with plumbing, and my plumbing wrenches don't help me fix bike tires. I'd be interested to see someone try it. (laughs) So we need to invest in the tools God has given us if we want to understand more about who he is and how he's called us to live. What's amazing about this is the tools aren't very different from the tools they had. We still have the Bible, the revealed Word of God. But we have an extra credit advantage. The Holy Spirit isn't just periodically available to us when we show up at places of worship. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you all day, every day, to testify to you what's true, to convict you of sin, to point you back to the truth over and over and over again. And that's what He does. So profound truth is not always received with pleasure, is not a note-taking outline point to help you see how foolish the Jewish guys were in the first century. It's to remind us that we have been blessed with profound truth, but we often fail to use the tools God God has given us correctly. And so we often fail to receive profound truth from God with the pleasure it should elicit inside of our hearts. So what happens next? How does Stephen respond to these guys gnashing their teeth at him. How might you respond to a crowd of angry people gnashing their teeth at you? Verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. A lot of things that we need to pull apart from these couple of verses. First, Are these the words you would choose to say to an angry mob who are mad about you and your special relationship with God? Probably not what I would have chosen. Second, the commentaries that I read on this were really interesting. I want to share that with you. The theories about Stephen seeing into heaven and seeing Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So there are some who write that there was a window, perhaps, in the council chamber that he was looking out so he could see into the sky and see Jesus. To me, that's not the most likely thing that's happening here. I believe this is supernatural because I can see out all these windows and I have never seen Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And we have a bunch of windows. I believe that God supernaturally equipped Stephen. Notice verse 55, it says, full of the Holy Spirit. I don't understand how being full with the Holy Spirit is relevant to my looking out a window and seeing something outside. Does that make sense? So I really think God is supernaturally equipping Stephen for a unique trial, the first martyr of the apostolic age, 
And so this is what's enabling him to supernaturally see into the throne room of heaven and see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, the second thing that's common in the commentaries is something that I, I think is accurate and important for us to think about, but it's not something we should be dogmatic or absolutely 100% sure this is what's really going on, but it makes sense to me. There are many, many references to Jesus being at the right hand of God in heaven, right? Throughout the Bible, you've read them before. But this one is different from most of them. Do you see what the difference is? Anybody notice? This one word is standing instead of seated. Usually, when we read about Jesus, he is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. This time, he's standing. And the question is, why did he get up? Why is Jesus standing in this verse? And the common thought is it's because he's got something that he's about to do. He got up because he's going to welcome Stephen into the throne room of heaven. And that, that's important enough to Jesus that he gets up off the throne to go and welcome his kid. But again, this isn't something that the Bible explicitly says. And we know from the rest of the Bible that whether Jesus is sitting or standing, he's not limited in his ability to welcome Stephen into heaven, right? But it's a picture that helps Stephen to see God cares about me. God's actively engaged in what's happening to me, even in the midst of my tragedy. That's why I think the word is different. So he announces to everybody, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I mentioned these are probably not the words that I would have chosen were I in Stephen's situation. Right? If there's an angry mob gnash, gnashing the teeth at me, I'm probably going to try to say something that helps them calm down. Right? Hey guys, relax, it's no big deal. But no, Stephen's just running with what he actually sees, with the truth that God has actually revealed to him. And that tells me that Stephen's not as stressed as I think I would be in this circumstance. He's not all worried about what these people are going to do. Because what he sees is more important to him than anything these people can do to him. And what I want us to see here is that profound peace is not dependent on circumstances. Profound peace is not dependent on circumstances. And this is contrary to the way we usually live our lives, right? If you've been stressed and you're having a hard time, what is the advice that we give people who are having a hard time and are stressed out? Change your circumstances, right? Go to the beach for a month and unplug everything and close your eyes and take a nap and then everything will magically be better and you won't be stressed anymore, right? Has anyone heard advice, at least something like that? Go get a massage, go take a mall day, Waste all your money, then you'll be less stressed. <laughs> not sure that's how it works. But what we see in Stephen is that it's not the circumstances that enable him to have peace. And in your life, it's not going to be the circumstances that give you peace. We sang the song this morning, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. That's what happened to Stephen. He could see Jesus. And if you can really clearly see Jesus and see the position of authority that he's in and his love for you, you're not going to be so worried about the stupid things that humans are doing, no matter what it is that the humans are doing. Because Jesus has authority over all of those things. Jesus has authority over every detail of our lives. This morning in the youth classroom, we were talking about 1 Peter. And that's a book that was written to Christians in Rome in the first century who were being persecuted. And the reason for hope that Peter gives the Christians in Rome who are being persecuted in the first century is that Jesus is at the right hand of God, the same words, he's at the right hand of God, and that all authority and power has been made subject to him. The same encouragement that Peter was going to give the folks in Rome about 30 years after this is what Stephen was experiencing firsthand. He could see Jesus in a position of authority with love for him. And that's a tool that we don't take advantage of as often as we should. Do you rehearse in your mind, do you repeat in your mind the fact that Jesus, the one who died in your place and saved you, is now in the greatest position of authority in the universe, and he loves you? Romans 5.8 says that but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The ultimate authority in the universe died for us. This is a reason to not be stressed out because of your circumstances. To see that there is a peace that is more powerful than your circumstances. And the first Christian to be killed for their faith demonstrated that in real time for everyone to see 
by smiling and gazing up into heaven as he was surrounded by an angry mob intent on ending his life. How do you think they're going to respond to that? Look at verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So they responded very calmly and with all manner of sanity. No, they lost their minds. They screamed and ran at him with no control over their emotions anymore. They're just so angry. We've got to end this guy. We've got to silence this unacceptable truth that he's sharing. And so they ran, him, ran at him and grabbed him and threw him out of the city and threw rocks at him with the purpose being the ending of his life. The little side note at the end of verse 58 is important for us to remember for the rest of the time we're going to be in the book of Acts. The witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. We're not really doing anything out with, with that this morning too much, but hold on to it. Remember that. These guys who were killing the first Christian martyr had Saul holding their coats for him while they took care of business. And what I want us to see with this is that the first Christian martyr having his life ended did not end the testimony of the church, did not kill the message that they were trying to kill. And that's something that the world around us needs to see, that silencing witnesses is ineffective. Silencing witnesses is ineffective. Why is that the case? This is not a point in your outline. Silencing witnesses is ineffective is a thing I really want us to get, but it's not one of your bullet points in your outline. We see because this has happened throughout history. In the 20th century, more Christians were killed than in all the preceding centuries combined. Were you aware of that? More Christians were killed in the 1900s than in the zeros through the 1800s. But that whole time, there's always been an active force in one or more nations seeking to silence the voice of God's people. Christians have been killed since the very first generation, and they're killed in even greater numbers today. How effective has that been in silencing the gospel? No! The most persecuted places see the most explosive growth of the church. You'd think somebody would figure that out and stop, but no, it doesn't work. And I think we've seen the same thing in our modern politics in the United States. Trying to silence people who are telling the truth often backfires. Trying to make up lies about people who are telling the truth often backfires. Why is that the case? This is in your outline. It's hard to argue with the truth. It's hard to argue with the truth. Even if you have beautiful PowerPoint slides and you made up all the best statistics and you have a list of esteemed colleagues supporting what you're saying, when you are arguing against the truth, you will ultimately lose. These words, the exact wording, came to me from a previous coworker. There was a guy who I had a lot of respect for. Uh, back in my early days of programming, he was more experienced, and so he was kind of the guy that I would go to with programming questions. But we worked in the same sort of work for the company. And so we, we had a pretty good relationship about the things we were trying to do, how we were trying to get them done. And so we usually agreed with each other on what should be done and how it should be done. And so at one point, uh, the people who were responsible for sending work to us claimed that they had provided something accurately and ahead of schedule when in fact they provided it late and the attempt at providing us accurate data was just garbage. It was brutal. Everybody looking at it could see it wasn't going to work. And they were crazy enough to send this in emails to people above us in the food chain. And because of the work we were doing, we kept all the data files because we need them to do our work. So I had the exact email and the exact attachment that had been in the email to demonstrate what they had actually given us and the date on which it came in. And that's all I did. I just put a nice little email with like two or three sentences. Here's what actually happened. And this older friend who was kind of like my mentor in programming said, see, it's hard to argue with the truth. The whole issue died because the, there's nothing you can do. The truth is there. That is the way it is with the gospel. People can yell and rant and scream and throw rocks as much as they want, but the truth of the gospel remains. 
Because God is not subject to the whims of humanity. God is not subject to the whims of politics or the whims of things that people think they desire for this generation. Those things come and go and wax and wane and change over time, but the gospel is forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. It's hard to argue with the truth. Verses 59 and 60, we see the end of the story for chapter 7. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So he knows he's dying. They're continuing to throw rocks at him. You can imagine the horror that most of us would feel in that situation. It hurts if you've ever been hit by a rock. Maybe as a kid you had rock fights with the brothers and sisters or cousins. That's what we did. And if you ever really get seriously hit by a rock, it hurts and it leaves a mark and you bleed and there's bruises. It's not pleasant. But these guys were using big rocks repeatedly to end his life. And in the midst of that chaos and pain and agony, Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. His source of hope didn't change when the rock started hitting him. He's still looking to Jesus as the answer for whatever circumstances he faces. And then watch this in verse 60. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Yikes. Do you think you could pray the same prayer as people are killing you with rocks? I don't think I would. I'd be looking to bring the gun to the rock fight. Most of us would, right? You're throwing rocks at me, you lost the opportunity to be on an even playing field. But that's not what he does. He gives them the benefit of the doubt. God, please forgive them. They're sinning. But please forgive them. Don't hold this sin against them. He wasn't looking for revenge, as most of us probably would. He wasn't even looking to change their immediate behavior. He was looking for them to have forgiveness of their sin. He was looking for them to have access to the same peace that he had. With his dying breath, he's praying for the people who killed him. And in doing that, he reveals something that shows us a different point of view than the one I think many of us operate on as we go through life here on planet Earth. That is, I am not the most important character in this story. I am not the most important character in this story. And we are told from grade school and maybe even preschool, if you went to preschool, how important each of us is and how our self-esteem is like the most important thing in the world. I must recognize how special and unique and precious I am. But there's a limit to the truth of those statements. You are precious. You are unique. You were created in the image of God. But none of those things makes you the most important person in the universe. This whole story from Genesis to Revelation is about God redeeming broken people to himself through who? Jesus Christ, not Chuck Orr, not whatever your name is. Jesus is the most important character in the story. How does that work when people are throwing rocks at me? If I'm the most important person in the story and people are throwing rocks at me, I've got to be the hero, right? I've got to go Indiana Jones and break out the whip, or I've got to go whatever your favorite army movie is and pull out my gun and end the threat to me, because a threat to me is the most important thing, right? They're attacking the most important character. But if that's what I really believe, if that's how I really live my life, I'm not using the tools that God has given me correctly. The most important character in the story is Jesus. And if that's really, really true, that means in the middle of my darkest day, in the middle of my tragedy, the reason that I'm on this earth is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. The reason we exist as a church is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we have for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. Not if it's a good day, not if all the people around me are being nice to me today, but every day, because it's His story, not mine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the time that You've given us together this morning, and we thank You for the example of people like Stephen who recognize that the most important character in this story is Jesus Christ. And I ask that you would help each of us to reorder our lives, to use the tools that you've given us to correctly understand the truth about yourself that has been revealed through your word, that we might live lives that always, every day, on every page, point to the the hero of the story, 
Help us to see that that hero is Jesus and not we ourselves. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.